Hey, what's up everybody? Today I've got the Ascend Audio Sierra LX speaker in for review. These retail for about $1,600 and were loaned to me by their owner. I'll give you a couple specs from their website. Nominal impedance is 8 ohm. Max continuous power is rated at 350 watts. The cabinet features 20 millimeter laminated bamboo and is internally braced. It is a vented design with a flared rear port tube. The tweeter is a customized version of Seos Titan Dome Tweeter. The woofer is a proprietary six inch custom designed by Seos of Norway. In my listening, I found that these speakers are best used when they are pointed slightly off axis. If I pointed them directly at my listening position in my larger room with the sidewalls that are kind of far away, I tended to find that the upper mid range and lower treble region lacked a little bit of attack. But when you tow them out, you kind of get more of the off axis sound and that gives you a little bit more filled in response through that particular region. Now I say this because this matters in how you set these speakers up. If you have a large room where you don't have a lot of sidewall reflection and you only get the direct sound when the speakers are pointed directly at you, then you're going to have a lack of attack clarity and detail in that upper mid range region. If you have the speakers turned out a little bit to where they are facing maybe about 10 to 20 degrees behind your listening position, then that upper mid range region is going to fill in a little bit, but the upper high frequency area, say above about 10 K where the shimmer and the sparkle and the sizzle of a hi hat lives, that's going to start to fall off. So you are going to have to be cautious when you set these speakers up and play around with towing and aiming like you would any other speaker. But I do find that for this reason, these speakers are maybe a little bit more mm, strict in how you set them up. In a room with sidewall reinforcement, this is going to fill in a little bit. But what I also noticed when I put these in a smaller room upstairs is that with no sidewall absorption in the other room and with sidewall reflection, the upper frequency range, I would say like four to eight kilohertz was a little bit more pronounced when the speakers pointed at me. So I still would recommend towing the speaker slightly off axis or set these up in a room where you have some sidewall absorption to capture the upper high frequency area in that same region. So it's not reflected as strongly back at the listening position. Aside from this aspect, which really isn't a lot, it's, it's kind of typical of most speakers. This is a very neutral sounding speaker with base extension down to about 40 Hertz in room. These speakers will get low. The flip side of that though, is that in order to get low, a lot of sensitivity is sacrificed. And my average sensitivity is measured at about 81 decibels at 2.83 volts, one meter. And you can see from this graphic, the base extension does show you get down to about 43 Hertz. <clears throat> In sacrificing sensitivity, there is also an apparent lack of output capability. So number one, you're going to need a pretty powerful amplifier to drive this to standard output levels that you might be used to getting from more typical sensitivity bookshelf speakers. And when I say more typical, usually it's around 85 decibels or so, but they only extend bass down to about maybe 60 Hertz. So you're gaining a good bit of extra bass extension, but you're going to need more power. The other aspect here is that as you turn the volume up, you will run into distortion if you are sitting far away from these speakers and you're trying to get to average listening levels of about 80 to 85 decibels. In my case, I was about 10 feet away with a pair of speakers. And I would say that when I hit around 82, 83 decibels, I started noticing mid-range distortion. And I'm going to address that when I get to some of the measurements in a little bit. I then flipped over to a different pair of speakers that had higher sensitivity, lower distortion, and, and keep in mind, those two don't necessarily go hand in hand, but they typically are seen as, um, as congruent. Is that the right word? I hope so. When I switched over to this other pair of speakers, the mid range distortion at that same SPL level was gone for all, for all intents and purposes. So I will say that the data shows higher mid range distortion from this speaker at higher levels. It's definitely audible, at least according to my listening session. The soundstage radiation of these speakers is pretty nice and wide. For me, it kind of hits that sweet spot of around plus or minus 60 degrees where it's not so wide that 
the imaging and the focus is really diffuse because of all the reflections in the room, but it's also not so narrow where the imaging and focusing is super precise, but you lose the sense of envelopment. Now, over the years, I figured that about plus or minus 60 degrees is where my sweet spot is. So that's how I know. How do you know? Well, the truth of the matter is you don't know unless you get some speakers to listen to and then have the data for them to understand what the radiation characteristics are. I would say that on average, most people tend to be like me, where they're between about 50 to 70 degrees, maybe a little bit more narrow, maybe a little bit more wide. But in that window is what I typically find people prefer. Of course, this is also room dependent and user preference. So it's not everybody is going to be the same way when it comes to this. Vertically, make sure that you're seated with your ears at level with the tweeter. And that's how I listen to these speakers. I noticed that if I dip down a little bit too much, or maybe when I stood up, especially when I stood up, but you're talking a couple feet difference, uh, the tonality shifted significantly. That's not a typical of a two-way bookshelf design at all, but it's just something to be aware of. Another aspect to keep in mind about this speaker is the output impedance of the amplifier you are using in relation to the response of the speaker. If you have an amplifier that has very high output impedance or very low damping factor, then the response of this speaker can change about two decibels or so at different points in its frequency response. So you can very well get a different sound from the speaker depending on the amplifier that you're using. If you're using something like an old set amp or maybe an older designed tube amp or maybe a older designed class D amplifier, not the newer ones of the last year or so, or even not ones that are like a Purify based or a Hypex based. But if we're talking about like the Aemas, the Fosse, the, uh, the Whims, those kind of levels, those up to about a year, maybe two years ago, had what is considered as a very load dependent circuit. And because of that, they also had high output impedance. So when you pair this speaker up with one of those kind of amps, then you can expect to have a different sound than what I'm describing to you and one that can vary from amp to amp. But at the end of the day, what you do wind up with is a pretty neutral sounding speaker. I think for me, the biggest con is the low sensitivity and the high distortion in the mid range. But if you're not listening to these speakers more than about 80 decibels at 10 feet for the pair, and let's say maybe you're sitting closer, then those won't be as much of an issue. But for me, that's a hindrance because I typically like to listen to speakers a little bit louder than around 80 decibels on average. And keep in mind when I'm talking about SPL, I'm talking about A weighted. I'm not talking about C weighted where you factor in the low bass. I'm talking about A weighted where it really focuses more on the uh, mid range and upper mid range aspect. So let's do the sound clip real fast. This is the on-axis response of this speaker compared to the original pink noise. And you're just listening for the differences. Any differences would be a sign of coloration that this speaker imparts on the original pink noise. And this is what you heard. So we've got the frequency response here. As I said earlier, mean SPL is about 81 decibels, F3 at about 47 Hertz, F10 at about 38 Hertz. If you look through the frequency response in black, you can see that it's pretty well within about plus or minus three decibels and almost really about maybe plus or minus one and a half decibels if you ignore this deep notch around three and a half kilohertz or so. Now, this is the area I was saying that if you're listening to these speakers in a large room without sidewall panels or uh, maybe even with sidewall absorption, you might notice this dip in response. And that's probably what you most likely heard in that sound clip. The other aspect that I do want to point out here is that there is a rising response on axis. I did talk to Dave, the owner of Ascend Acoustics, and he raised some concerns about this. And the reason that he raised concerns is because I sent him some measurements that did not match the measurements that are on their website. Now, long story short, he ran into an issue with the particular woofer itself. He took care of the customer, sent me replacement woofers. We were good to go. 
the other aspect that he was concerned about was the high frequency. Now we've talked about that and I'll have a little bit of information for you in the backup, but I know that some of you might be nitpicking my measurements versus Dave's on his website. And I kind of wanted to go ahead and lay that groundwork up front. So you would be aware that I am aware of it and that I also took the time to hunt down what the issue was. This is the CEA 2034 data set. Everything looks pretty good here. I mean, we can see a resonance around 700 Hertz, 600, 700 Hertz or so. This is the estimated interim response. And this line dictates what I heard in my listening room. Now, earlier I talked about in a larger room, you're more likely to hear the direct on axis sound. And I recommended towing the speakers out. And I said, when I put them in a smaller room with nearby sidewalls that you're going to get something more akin to this response. And that means that this upper mid range area is filled in more than what you saw in the on axis response only, but you still have a rising treble response that to me sounded a little bit bright. So that's why I still recommend taking the speakers and towing them out a little bit. Now I would not say to point them directly out into the room at 30 degrees. To me, that's too extreme. I think maybe 10 to 20 degrees is probably the sweet spot, but it really is up to you and your room. These are kind of just guidelines. Burst decay shows some extended decay in the upper mid-range area, which aligns with the resonance that I talked about in the CEA 2034 data set. Harmonic distortion at 86 decibels, and then at 96 decibels. This is the area that I ran into in terms of audible distortion. In order to sanity check myself, I did a lot of other measurements in room with an SPL mic. I did some sweeps. I listened at low volume and then I ramped it up high volume really quick. And then I had another speaker sitting right next to it that I could compare back to back with. And I knew the other speaker had low mid range distortion. So in doing that, what I've come to the conclusion of is that this right here is what I was hearing. And the best way I can describe it is a loss of detail in the mid range. It's almost like congestion. Now this isn't new. This isn't me picking on this design. In fact, I've run into this many times, but I think it's an area where we can see that while the frequency response looks pretty darn good through this area, you can run into other issues such as SPL limitations due to distortion. And that was the case here. If you put a subwoofer with a speaker, or essentially if you cross it over at 80 Hertz, this is what you wind up with. Short-term compression shows us pretty big issues at high output volume. But if you stay at around 96 decibels or so in terms of compression, instantaneous short-term compression, uh, you're not really gonna have any issues to worry about. Now, yeah, you do have some loss of control in the bass, but again, this is pretty much par for the course. Impedance shows a resonance wiggle in 500 to about 700 Hertz, somewhere in that region. And that lines up with the CEA data that we saw earlier. Uh, min impedance is about 5.5 ohm. So it's close to that nominal rating of eight ohm. Most amplifiers should have no problem driving these speakers with the load, but consider they're at about 81 decibel sensitivity. So you are gonna need some additional power to get to your typical volume levels if you're coming from a bookshelf speaker that has like 85 decibel or 86 decibel sensitivity. Now this gives us an idea of what the amp induced frequency response differences can be so essentially, hey, if I've got a state-of-the-art amplifier that has very low output impedance, very high damping factor, you are gonna get the frequency response that I showed you earlier. If you use amplifiers with high output impedance and you start going from this blue medium output impedance to high and to very high, then you can see that you can shift the frequency response by as much as two decibels in the mid-range and about one and a half decibels on the higher frequency end of things. And real fast, this is a measurement of the frequency response of both speakers gated down to about 200 Hertz. Now, the accuracy of the mid-range, it's not great, right? These are not anechoic measurements. But really what I was trying to understand is why was I getting different measurements than Dave's measurements on his website? And we can see that the dome tweeter is breaking up around 22 to 25 kilohertz or so, give or take. Uh, but the red, which was the primary sample that I've showed you all these measurements for, is the one that tends to trend upward more quickly uh, than the blue, which is the secondary speaker. And these two speakers are at about three decibels apart, even at 20K. So there is going to be some tolerance that the manufacturer has with their own drivers. 
something like this, I think is kind of, again, par for the course when you're talking about a pair of speakers shipped to your door for $1,500 with a nice gloss finish. This is not out of the realm of expectation, but I really just wanted to show this to show that I've done my due diligence here in this review. So that does it for this review. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, let me know in the comment section below. If you'd like to support what I'm doing here, you can do so one of a few different ways. You can join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner, and that's a way to directly support me, and you get behind-the-scenes information, early access to videos and data, and just random things that I'll drop there from time to time. You can also use any of my generic affiliate links in the description section below. And if you want to buy something from, for example, Amazon, you want to buy a television from them, or you want to buy new underwear because your butt stinks, shower guys, then you can do that through that generic link. Just go buy whatever it is you want from any of those links, and then that will earn, earn me, that will earn me a uh, small commission at no additional cost to you. And I definitely appreciate all of your support. I will talk to you all later. Take care.